Thank you so much for coming today, guys. My name is Joey Quintero, and that is correct. I essentially went to school to become a chemist, and beyond that, I, for some reason, fell into mathematics, chemistry, and the sciences, whatnot, and it came very easy to me at a very young age in high school and whatnot. Uh, so I got my BS in chemistry from the University of Arizona, and I worked for a dermatologist for a number of years and taught calculus for a number of years at a high school, and that was a lot of fun. But I'll be honest with you, the whole time I had a camera in my hand since the eighth grade. I was introduced to into photography about the eighth grade-ish by my aunt who had an old Roly, And uh, I always found it fascinating that she would look down into this thing and just have an inverted image and the way she composed it, the way she calibrated her, her thoughts and feelings, but more importantly, the way she underlined the passion in taking photographs. And that's really was, was really contagious for me at that time. And more importantly, I was very impressionable and I kind of like the the science behind photography, and we all know that we're kind of nerdy in that regard, and I'll, I'll jump into that later. And so after school, teaching, working with a dermatologist, I decided to go to Paris for about three years and study at the Speo School of Photography, and that's when I really, really fell for it. <clears throat> with that, I uh, assisted photographers from LA to Mexico City and Paris, uh, and now to New York. I had the Scary, scary uh, adventure of moving out here, uh, 2001, uh, working for a photographer. Uh, we used to shoot a lot of Avon and uh, Maybelline stuff like that. His name is Steve DiCagno. Extremely accomplished, uh, got a great eye. And 9-11 hit. And unfortunately, he went from a million dollar business to a zero business in about a month. And so did Joey. And uh, I stopped assisting, assisting quite a bit for different guys. And I noticed the market was really starting to take a change. And if you're familiar with New York, which I'm sure you guys are, the whole industry kind of changed a lot for all of us at that time. And what happened is I started becoming very observant to what we were all doing as artists. We all started wearing a little more hats in the, at the end of the day. Um, we all started doing a little more Photoshop. We got into video and whatnot as, as digital emer emerged in our lives. And at that point, I decided, I, I have a mortgage, I need to start getting a real job. I applied at B&H and had the New York experience of working in the lighting department. And I did that for a number of years, and that was really good for me. One, I got to work with every one of the lights that are high-end and low-end within the industry. Let's face it, every vendor caters to B&H as far as lighting equipment goes. But beyond that, I got to become a New Yorker. I got to know what people are looking for, and I got to self-educate myself in dealing with equipment, people, and more importantly, what's savvy, what's quick, what's going to work for this job or that job or whatnot. Um, with that in mind, uh, a few years later, uh, B&H started producing some of their own in-house products, and I joined that group. That is called the Gratis Group. It is now a subsidiary or a branch company of B&H. And I started off as a researcher, as a tester, and uh, doing some engineering, I guess, if you want to call it that, and now more, more concentrating on the market end of the Gratis Group. Uh, the Gratis Group is designs different photo accessory products, audio products, photo products, lighting products like Impact, and uh, we're taking over the world, as they say. Uh, make a long story short, <clears throat> please save your pen and pencils. If you want to, I have business cards here. I will be more than happy to email you the PDF file of this slideshow. That way you can concentrate on the show, and more importantly, um, you can have your own little copy or your version of Joey's mini lecture. This is a one part, this is one of a uh, several part series of this lecture. This is the basic elementary part of lighting and what well, essentially what a softbox does, what a beauty dish does, what an umbrella does, why I love umbrellas so much, why silver umbrellas are great, and give you my two cents and all that. Um, I do have some very, very uh, technical examples on how things were lit, uh, how they were, what equipment they were done, and why I did it. Um, you have any questions, comments, like David mentioned, please feel free to ask. This class is not only for you, but you coming out here today says a lot about you guys. In the middle of the day, coming out here and listening to me, what? More importantly, this class is for me so I can ga get a gauge of what the consumer is in need of as far as photo accessories go. I need to feel you guys out as far as what your needs and wants and what your skill levels are. So this is also good research for myself on, on that regard. Uh, Beyond that, um, you're going to hear me get very passionate about different art. Um, first and foremost, we're artists here, okay? The same way I was very intrigued with my aunt's Roly, I knew at some point there was something inside of me where I was a visionary. And that's what you guys really are, you're visionaries. Um, 
Beyond that, you're allowed to apply your scientific, left-brained part of your, your skill into your art. Um, so keep in mind here, if I get a little foo-foo, forgive me for saying that, and if I get a little passionate, it's because I'm an artist first and foremost. And without blood, sweat, and tears, and a lot of disappointment, I wouldn't be here today, quite honestly. And this is why I've had my successes, and I've had a lot of downside, and more importantly, I've learned from my failures. And I think that's kind of what you have to accept as an artist. And I'm going to be really, really explicit in that as far as uh, my passion goes. So if I get a little mushy, forgive me. I promise not to cry. But uh, beyond that, again, if you have any questions, comments, feel free to ask. Uh, where else are we going to go? PDF version, I'm going to send you guys if you need it. Uh, beyond that, let's get started. Okay. Oh, something else I wanted to cover. <clears throat> Keep in mind, since this is my class today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be conducting three different quizzes throughout the day. And I do have three impact 32-inch silver white reflectors to give out to the correct answer. The only thing you got to do, though, is you got to get up in front of the class and explain the answer. It's not Jeopardy now, but it's something that we're going to be covering throughout the class. And we'll coax you along the way. But God, honestly, you're going to walk away with a silver and white 32-inch impact reflector by me, OK? So it's something that you can walk away with if you pay attention. All right. So essentially what we're going to cover today is we're going to cover continuous lighting with the one light setup. And one thing I want to underline real quick as far as continuous lighting goes, if you're into photo and video, I suggest you invest in some type of continuous light. It's going to help benefit the both dis disciplines in this case. Um, I strictly do photo at this point. I do dabble in some video, but I'm never showing anybody. It's the kind of stuff of the cats at the house or maybe a kid flying a kite or that snowstorm the other night. Um, Beyond that, I'm going to show you a two light setup with continuous light with a rim light or a hair light as they commonly call that. I'll show you some examples of how to do a setup. Um, some examples I did, very, very elementary samples that we did here at the event space just to show you an idea what it's going to look like. And then I'm going to show you pictures of my rendition of what you see here, okay? And keep in mind, I do shoot fashion, I do editorial, whatnot, and I never follow the rules. But I do practice the fundamentals when I'm shooting, okay? Uh, beyond that, I'm going to give you some tips on using a light meter and a flash ambient meter whatnot. <clears throat> show you the importance of using one. I'm going to show you a studio flash setup. Uh, why would you want to use, to use a studio flash? Uh, the use with a studio flash with an umbrella, with a softbox, and with a beauty dish. And I'll give you examples of each one of those setup. Uh, a primary example, and again, my example of the, something that I shot for a job. Uh, let's back up just a little bit before we get started. Before we move on, I think it's extremely important that you guys, as artists, as technicians, start understanding the ratios of light. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, shame on you. Secondly, ratios of light is the way, is about the big three. We need to start thinking in the big three if you're real photographers. Photography is based on aperture, it's based on shutter, and ISO. You need to make sure your living, waking day is thinking about aperture, shutter, and ISO, because these are the three variables that are going to allow you to nail that shot. If you dream of a shot, you got to think in the th big threes. There's going to be a quiz later on that, hint, hint. Uh, let's first cover ratios, OK? Essentially, it's important for you guys to see the difference between the different ratios. Uh, the same way when I'm looking outside right now, inside's like a 1.8, outside's like an f5.6. We'll deal with the shutter later at, at uh, 100 ISO. This is how you need to start thinking every day especially when you start composing your shots. Start thinking in the big threes, aperture, shutter, and ISO. You guys are listening. ASA. <laughs> ASA, thank you. <laughs> Old school. I love it. <clears throat> Let's get started here. Now, OK, this is not gospel, but I'll be very honest with you. This is something that I put together over the last 10, 15 years or so. And it's something that I've used other photographers, got their input, and kind of applied it to my own chart. Because let's face it, all of us get stuck every once in a while during a shoot. What you see up here doesn't easily translate to here and finally through here through your camera. Your job is as artists is to take up here, in here, and to put it through your camera. That's really where the big threes come in. Aperture, shutter, and ISO. That's why you need to start practicing those three. Because up here and here don't interpret well to the camera. You have to apply these three. Now, Let's start thinking in ratios now, OK? A one to one ratio. We have two lights, both set up on me. I'm sitting here. 
boom, two lights on me. Two lights at the very same power is a one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah. Very flat light. A good example of a one-to-one -one ratio is a mug shot. Nothing that I can share with you today. Um, but you all know what a mug shot looks like. That's a great example of a one-to-one -one ratio. Sometimes a one-to-one -one ratio is, is important if you're doing events or whatnot. Uh, maybe if you're shooting the mayor on a podium, a one-to-one -one ratio is definitely acceptable. Is it artistic? Not really. Is it just flat light? Yes. And what we say by flat light is really one-dimensional. Okay. Is there a time and place? Yes. Is it for you? That's up to you to decide. Um, me, I try not to practice a one-to-one -one ratio. I go more around the two-to-one, two to three-to-one, and sometimes the four-to-one. But that's me. You guys are the artists. Pick your discipline. Now, a two-to-one ratio is basically like a high-key background. Basically, a high-key background is nothing more than when you have, oh, I got a good example here. When you have a background that is twice the light as your foreground. And if you have any questions about these prints, real quick here. What we have here is a model here. We shot her at 5.6. The background is twice the exposure. That makes the background an F8. So we're dealing with a 2 to 1 ratio. That is, the background is twice the light as our subject. Make sense? By the way, this was shot with a 10D, 6 megapixels, back in the day. It was my only digital camera that I ever bought. And by the way, I don't own a camera anymore, FYI. So if you guys have any questions about the prints or whatever, there's, please don't feel free to ask. Um, 2 to 1 ratio, remember, twice the light. So if I'm shooting at f11, my primary subject, and I want the background to be twice as bright, what's my f-stop for the background? F11, need twice the light. 16, thank you. One f-stop equals twice the light. Remember, 2, 8, 4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16, 22, 32, boom. And 64 if you're really, oof, you got a camera then. Uh, yes, sir? No, please. I'm a little confused. Me, when I'm looking at that picture of that lady, yes. the white background, yeah. it looks like if you go to F16, you darken the background. The, I, I want to try and figure that now, out. Th now, keep in mind, you're closing down because you have more light. The same way when you go outside on July, July 4th at noon in New York City, look up in the sky, your pupil goes, you, it closes down. Why? Because it's so darn bright. It's extremely bright. So you need to start thinking in f-stops, ratios, the big threes, OK? So again, subject shot at 5.6, background is twice the light. What is our f8? f8 thank you. You're, gonna, you're, you're, you're a little advanced with this class. <laughs> <laughs> OK, two to one ratio, very easy. We're going to do, we're gonna do some, I'm going to show you some more examples here in a, in a few. But beyond that, there might be a quiz on it, hint, hint. <clears throat> oh, let's go back up a little bit. 3 to 1 ratio is basically black and white film. You see transitions between white all the way to black. <clears throat> you have gradations of white, gray, dark gray, darker gray, darker gray, and all the way to black. A good 1 to 3 ratio, a good Ansel Adams prints, re really is a great example of a 1 to 3 ratio. Okay? Think of the zone, you think of black and white. Some are more, some are less, but it's it very subjective at that point. Again, I'll show you some examples. Um, four to one ratio. Basically, it's two stops, four times the light, two stops. We got that, right? Let's do, do a little mini quiz here. If I'm at five, six, and I want my background to be a four to one, what's my background? I'm five, six. It's 11. No, wait. Five, six. OK. All right. It's going to be a quiz. I'm going to be tough on you guys, too. <clears throat> Dramatic low-key lighting. How many have you seen Touch of Evil with Orson Welles, an incredible film noir movie? If you haven't seen it, write it down, and shame on you for not seeing it at this point. If you are a real, real, if you're hungry to examine light, the way Orson Welles shot this is it is using a fine example of Chiado Scudo, which is basically lights and darks, essentially. But it's telling a story with drastic lights and darks. 
touch of evil. Every film student, every photo student owes it to themselves to see it. <clears throat> a must. Dramatic low key lighting. That is lights, darks, usually an 8 to 1 ratio. That's four stops ish difference. So imagine the contrast of light between the lights and darks. And this is why Touch of Evil, Orson Welles, I said it again, got to see it. He tells a story, but just with stark whites and stark blacks. Incredible story. You should see it. Two to one ratio here. Essentially, what we have uh, this was a beauty shot we did a couple of months ago. And it's nothing more than a two light setup. We have an umbrella on our subject. She was shot at F11, and the background metered at 16, thank you. <clears throat> Which basically blew out her background, very easily done. A typical two to one ratio. Subject again F11, background F16, it automatically blows out the highlights. Question, when yes. You're on location, you want to avoid the shot background, then you have to work with shutter speed. That's correct. Right. That's correct. Now, just FYI, you make a, I'll come into that. I have some outdoor examples. Um, I tend to shoot mostly indoors. When I shoot, well, I back up. When I shoot indoors, I'm usually shooting at a 1 over 125 shutter speed. I got a nice little spiel here about that. Reason being is because some people say, why aren't you shooting at 1 over 250? Because you'll catch the blinks in the models. I said, well, 1 over 125 is usually good enough to catch most human movement. Most. It's not going to catch a man on a horse or running from a horse or running from a bull very well. But it does catch a blink. It'll catch a subtle movement. It catches wind when it's being thrown by a fan or whatnot. Uh, 1 over 125. I don't like to stress my equipment out. The reason why I say this is because the same way you don't press your pe gas, the pedal to the metal every time you get in your car, you use it accordingly. This is how I kind of treat my equipment as well. I, have, I own no camera, and I made that very clear. But I have some very good lighting equipment. And I only use it as much as I need. I don't pump up the power all the way, and I don't drop it all the way. I kind of use it in the middle somewhere and try to find a sweet spot. And when you're investing in equipment, my best advice is, is treat it gingerly and use it with moderation. The same thing with your camera. Why would you want to put that much stress onto your shutter knowing that your camera's only going to get like 50,000 uh, uh, releases out of it, or so, I don't know. Um, but it's good to kind of practice a little moderation. These are tools. They're extensions of yourself. They're extensions of your passion. Okay. Typical black and white shot. You can see the gradations between the white in her eyes and the black in her hair. Detail throughout the shot. This is not a low key lighting shot. This is your typical one to three shot. And then you got the background which is going kind of gray or whatnot. And again, shot over one over 125, easily done. Uh, what else was I going to say about this shot? Oh. <clears throat> She had a severe cold that day, and she kept sneezing and whatnot. Um, make a long story short is, we started to hit her with the fan. And sometimes when you're working with a subject, sometimes you just have to add variables within the shot. So she just couldn't compose herself. I said, you know what? Let's just make a mess out of you. So we started just getting very messy with the hair. My uh, two cents on this, or the model behind this, is that Sometimes you can get something very good when you're working with kind of mediocre uh, talent for the day. And she was not feeling well. So we kind of messed it up, and we got a little gem out of it. And um, you got to work with it. This, I have a good story. Go ahead, please. Yes, um, I'm a computer geek. So my question is, how do you get the background? If you're shooting with one camera, how do you get the background to be 20 to 15 photos and the other one? If, well, you're going to be shooting, you mean you're shooting with one camera or one light? One, you're shooting with one camera. You said one, you're shooting with one camera. That's yeah, why. Yeah, so I'm just curious, how do you get the lights to do that? Okay. The same way you see me and I see you, there's a different ratio between the two. But the audience sees us both, and our eyes are adjusting between the ratio. Okay. What's happening is the exposure is changing up here. You have to trick the camera into seeing the same plane. So what we did here, make a long story short, is I have two lights. You can see it's a soft box. It's wrapping around. Actually, this is an umbrella. It's wrapping around her. It's, it's set up at about 45 degree angle from the subject. And then I have a different light source onto the background. The camera, if she shot at f11, I'm automatically setting the camera right now for at f11 because that's what I need to get. We all know that aperture prescribes depth of field. So I have to get make sure that everything's tack sharp. She's going to be f11. I have to make sure when I meter my strobes for the background that I'm getting f16. 
So it's essentially two different subject matters that I'm dealing with. This is how you need to start thinking, especially as photographers. We are dealing with a two-dimensional plane and it's our job to make it three-dimensional to our viewer. That's really the trick of a good photographer, it really is. Um, and how do we do that with lights? Go ahead, buddy. Watt seconds, sure. And that's it. So you, you just turn up the pack, the same way you have a gas pedal. Every strobe unit has a gas pedal. Well, okay, so. And so you, you're going to hit me with F, F11, okay? We have one light on me, F11. I get very specific on this to come, but we'll cover it now. F11, boom, all right? Beyond that, now I have to treat my background as a secondary subject. I have secondary lights and I pump those up till I get an F16 on my background. Now if I set my exposure for Joey at F11, Joey's gonna be tack sharp, and what's gonna to happen to my background since it's overexposed? It's gonna go white. Exactly. No, I just don't understand how you measure that before you do the shot. Just with the light meter. No, no, a, 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 you have to use a handheld light meter. And I got a whole spiel on that as well. It's coming up. Are you familiar with the light meter? Or? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'm going to show you. Strobe meter. I don't have one. Yeah, you need a light meter. It's the equivalent of driving on the interstate without a speedometer in your car. <laughs> you know, you have an idea. You can, you know, you can kind of stay with traffic, but you really don't know how fast you're going. You know, we'll cover that, though. We'll cover that. Uh, photo one ratio, contouring. You guys have some good questions, and I like that. Um, contouring, shadows. Uh, this is a young lady that we did for a modeling agency a few years back. And to make a long story short is, it was pouring rain that day, and this poor couch had been thrown out, I don't know, like a month ago, and we noticed that it had began to mildew a little bit. Her booker said, can we take that couch up because we need somewhere to sit? And I said, yeah, but it's gross. I don't care, we'll throw some stuff on it. I just need somewhere to sit. Most studios don't have a very comfortable seating environment. We dragged the couch up, and I said, wow, I kind of like to shoot her with that couch, just for the, for the contouring or whatnot, it's just pretty. So it ended up becoming a I don't know how many people we shot with this couch like this. The moral of the story is, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And believe me, since you're artists, you're visionaries, if you see something and it inspires you, pick it up and drag it inside and then get rid of it when you're done with it. Because um, you never know. I mean, this thing, this couch <laughs> created so much art for me. And it's, I'm, I'm, again, very passionate about this, okay? Again, one soft box set up to the side, you can see it wrapping around the model. Four to one ratio, that's two times the light difference. Works well. Uh, one to eight ratio. Now we're getting into dramatic low key lighting. And what you can see here is we have very, very stark highlights and we have very, very dark low lights. And the way we depend on low lights or blacks getting exposed is surely by the reflection. You can see off her shoe here, it's not really lit, it's more of the reflection popping off of it. And give you an idea, this, this shot was essentially about a purse, it was a purse manufacturer or whatnot. Make a long story short is they wanted something different, they wanted something dark, but they had to see all the detail. And all we did was hit her with a, a 10 degree spot there. I have another light bouncing off the wall there. And I think there's one from the rear that's coming, that's kind of in between her legs, that little triangle. And, uh, it did a pretty good job lighting up the, 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 uh, the product. Typical low-key lighting, dramatic. And I want to say Touch of Evil is even more dramatic than this. It's even more stark, which makes it even much more of a, a gem to watch. Oh, we have a quiz. Okay, guys, listen up. <clears throat> Describe one to two lighting, one to two ratio lighting, what it is, and describe it if you could, please. There's a 32-inch silver and white impact reflector in for it, for you. Takers, why don't you stand up for me? Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Wonderfully said. I got a 32 inch reflector for you. Yeah, I got two more guys. 
Okay. Very well said. I like that. She was paying attention. Ugh, bring a tear to my eye. Yes, please. Go ahead. One more time, sir. What's going to happen is you'll get some bleeding across. I mean, that's entirely, you've seen, we've all seen imagery where the, the background is essentially enveloping your subject. Yeah. That's very subjective. It's a very cool effect. I mean, a lot of people tend to use a bare bulb in that regard. Um, if you look in this month's PDN, Scheinflung is a, the only reason I remember because I saw it yesterday, Scheinflung is a rental house in, in the city. And they did a great example of a highlight wrapping around their subject. It's this guy carrying an RE lamp of some sort and cords. And again, he's being wrapped around this light. Kind of a cool effect. Uh, that's entirely up to you. And again, that is up to you as an artist. And that's your license. Very good question. Um, right here, FYI, she's about seven feet from the background. And you need at least six or seven feet if you're going to do high key right to do it right, unless you're doing a mug shot. You know, um, you could probably get away with a head and shoulder shot possibly, but if you're gonna do anything a full length, one thing that we can't do as artists, but as scientists we try, is we can't fight physics. And light is nothing more than photons. You're not gonna bend them, you can shape them, you can modify them, but you're not gonna change their behavior pattern. That's essentially what you need, you just need a little more space. It's because of the orientation of the light source. You need more surface area, that's what you need. You should just try putting them onto an umbrella. Um, at impact, shameless uh, plug in here, we make it one stand, one light that's made for an on-camera flash and that umbrella will give you surface area, will help spread out the light a little bit. More importantly, it'll dampen the shadows. Again, but you need more, f more footage between your background and your subject. Yes. Or compared to an elephant, absolutely. Very much so, yes. It makes a huge difference. Surface area is a big deal in lighting. Huge deal. No, you got you to go the distance. Because you know why? Because when you shoot children, brides, children, brides, and anything fluffy like that, they like a very, very white background. And to make your job easier, why not just build a nice little cyclorama? If you don't know what a cyclorama is, ask me later, and because there's a ton of YouTube videos that show you how to build a cyclorama. That'll work best if you're shooting kids, because it'll allow you to let the kids play around, get on your knees and just nail the shot, you know, however you deem necessary. Is this the distance dictated by the lens? <coughs> like, you have an 80 uh, lens and you need mm -hmm. 100. You can't go, you can't really go wherever you want. You have to go wherever the lens touches. That's correct. If you're working with a fixed focal length, that's, focal. that's correct. Absolutely. And again, these are, you can't fight physics. Yeah. These are things that you're dealing with optics. I mean, let's face it, photography is, you know, lighting and optics, ultimately. The capture's changed. It's going to change. Um, but that's really what we're stuck with right now is lighting and optics. And unfortunately, like I say, you can't fight physics. You, you know, you, you're bound by it, you know, unless you want that effect. Yes. The background originally a white background. What if you had a blue background? Yes, the background was originally white. You can blow out the background, but remember, you're going to need more light to to undersaturate it. Yeah. So if it was like a blue background, then you did the same exposure f8 to f11. The blue would change. The blue would change. What would happen if you think about this? Think of adding more water to our blue. What's going to happen? It's going to dilute it. It becomes less saturated. It turns like a grayish. It turns more like a grayish. Exactly, a muddy gray, bluish. And again, that might be a cool effect, depending on what you're going for. Okay, again, you did a great job. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, as far as continuous lighting goes, we designed this kit at Impact about, ooh, about a year and a half ago. And when we were working with the prototypes and whatnot, um, I turned out to love this light. It's essentially, uh, make, it, make it a long story short is, we have sold tens of thousands of this unit, and we underestimated how much we needed to manufacture. It's nothing more than a nine light, octabank, daylight balanced, cool light source. So essentially you get daylight in an octabank. It's good for video, uh, photo and whatnot. And more importantly, it's cool to the touch. So you can sit there with your subject for hours on end. The bulbs last for thousands of hours on top of that. It's a good little steal. 
make a long story short is <clears throat> when setting up the continuous one light source, I'm going to show you my example here in a second. Now, always start with this setup. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that Joey's right about every setup, the way you shoot every portrait, but the fundamentals, this is what you need to apply for yourself. Always start at 45 degrees with your primary light. A lot of photographers, a lot of videographers, depending on what you're doing, they call that the key light. And basically, if I were being shot, it's at 45 degree angle from my left or from my right. That's entirely up to you whether you want to go left or right. If they have a big mole on their face, they have a huge nose, whatever, you may want to position them differently. Um, but start at 45 degree angle. If you're going to start with a reflector, I use a reflector very similar to this in the studio, and basically it doesn't have all these funky colors. I usually pick one color, and what I'll do is I'll describe each color here in a few minutes. And I usually set that up at another 45 degree angle for my subject, and it helps fill in some of the shadows. So again, always start with this primary setup, and then kind of tweak it how you deem necessary for your subject. Especially if you're shooting people. If you're shooting objects or whatnot, a toaster, a refrigerator, those pretty much stay the same, but for people, you kind of have to give them your personal touch. Remember, we're artists, we all have a thumbprint, and it's very important that you leave your thumbprint once you're gone. One light set up, we did this here with the OctaCool. We have one light set up at 45 degree angle. We have a reflector at 45 degree angle. Easy kill, okay? Simple as that. And I decided to go grayscale with this just so you can see the fundamentals of the light. Nothing fancy, and honestly, it took us 10 minutes to take the shot. That easy. 45 degree angle from our subject, 45 degree angle with our reflector, easy. All right? Yes? Um, what do you mean by continuous light and what's it on? Continuous light means it's the light that's always staying on, hence continuous. <laughs> the opposite in photography would be strobe units. Strobe units come in different fashions. They come in a DC, which is battery operated, a monoblock, which is a self contained unit or you can buy as a pack and light source. A pack, and then you have a light that extends from it. Um, we usually use in photography, we use either continuous because of the advent of digital and how sensitive it is, or we use strobe. I primarily, primarily use strobe, personally speaking, but I, I'll bounce around between continuous every blue moon. Do you have any recommendations for how high uh, the light should be? Ah, I was waiting for that. <laughs> no, thanks, I appreciate it. 20 degrees above the eye, the light should start. And again, this is not gospel, but this is the way the fun, this is the fundamentals of how we see light. Remember, as Homo sapiens, we stand upright. Most of us do. We are used to seeing light coming from above because the sun is above us. So it's very important as an artist that you see the light just above the horizon. This is why we start with my light at 45 degree angle and just about 20 degrees above the eye. Some subjects more, some subjects less, but as long as it's not too hard where you get a hard shadow and, you know, uh, these uh, ghoul eyes or whatnot. Um, start there. It's a very good question. Yes? Is the light angled down towards? I would angle the light down more, so, yeah. And if you, if you want to go that route. There's a technique that's called feathering the light, which I'm going to get into real quickly, and that's where you want to kind of change the angle of the light or whatnot. Um, any more questions before we move on? Yeah. Go ahead, please. What's the, your camera setting on something like that? Something like that, that was shot at 5.6. 5.6? Yeah. Six yeah. Because it's continuous light, light, I'm bound by the shutter speed at this point. Yeah. I want to say it's like 1 over 50, 1 over 60. I'm talking about manual, so yeah. everything. Every, always manual. I've shot program maybe twice in my life. So I'll get you next time. That's correct. You're not shooting kids, you're not shooting uh, ra uh, racing horses, Indy 500 cars, just not enough light. That's when you use strobes because it, it allows you, a, uh, what I should say, is a longer stroke in your gas pedal. You have a much more options. That's really what it is. That's why I like strobes. Uh, I just want to know how far between the perceptive light between the subject and the subject. Another good question. Okay. How, how far should I set up my light from my subject? First of all, we're going to set our light up at how many degrees away from our subject? 45. How much above the eye? 20. <clears throat> Where's our reflector at? I usually set my light up at starting at three feet away from my subject. Starting at three feet. The octa? The octa cool, that's correct. And that's usually mo for most softboxes. 
That's a starting point. It doesn't make it gospel, it doesn't make it right, it doesn't make it wrong. It's just a good way for you to visualize the surface area that you need or, need or take away. No, please. This is our class. Yes. Distance. Distance. Look at the shadow here. Okay? Distance. I'm not, I, and the thing is, you can't, change, you can't change science. You can't change photons. Now, if I were a subject, you know, or if, if I were a subject, this far, okay, and I was shooting my, my hand, now on a direct plane of light, what's going to happen? The light goes past. You're not going to see the shadow. And this is when you need to start playing with physics a little bit. What I would do is maybe raise the light up a little bit if you're dealing, getting hard with shadows, especially if you're shooting kids. Maybe you need to raise the light up a little bit. Maybe a strobo frame would be quite helpful to raise the light up above the plane. And then the reflector? The reflector, again, very subjective. It depends where you need the light. Reflectors do nothing more than throw light back at your subject. Let's go on to this. This is a good, good time to jump into this. Essentially, a reflector is nothing more than surface area that you're trying to create to throw back light. There's different methods in, in which we're going to practice here. Black is what? This is the absorbs light. It's called subtractive lighting. When you need to take away light and you need to get rid of it, let's say you're standing by a big building, a big white building, and you just want to get rid of that extra light, black's going to do it. I recommend everybody have a gobo or a black reflector in this case. You're going to need it, and when you do pull it out, you're going to thank me. Gold essentially helps warm up our subject. Soft gold does the same thing, but it's a little more passive than our primary gold. Why gold? Because it gives us that very early morning and very late at night or evening kind of, early evening kind of look. Golden light is something that is very pleasing to most homo, homo sapiens. Uh, portrait artists, the shame is, is that late 70s and early 80s, every portrait photographer was using gold fill for everything. Do I use it? No. Heck no. <laughs> Uh, we'll get into that later. Silver is just a good one-to-one -one reflector. Think of silver very much like a, like a mirror. It's, it's going to lose less light. It's going to be more efficient at throwing light at your subject. And if you just need a quick fill under the nose, um, you need to light up somebody's black shirt or something like that, silver is going to do it. It's proof positive. This is, I want to say this is white translucent. Two different grades of white translucent. White translucent is extremely helpful when you want to shoot something like this. This was shot in the bare sun, and what we did is we got a 6x6 six six white translucent reflector, and basically what we did is we held it between the sun and our subject. Now imagine Molly sitting out there, and what we did is we just hit her with this, and it was a nice diffusion so we could get a perfect, perfect exposure. And you can see it's almost shadowless except for underneath the arms where the shadow is acceptable. So think of diffusion or a translucent scrim as an easy kill. So sometimes the sun is your friend, but you also have to tame it. And you do it with something like this. Hence, and it comes in two different gradations, usually a half stop or a third stop or whatnot. Every manufacturer makes these. Here at Impact, we make this as well as in, in a 5 by 7 on top of that. But uh, a handy tool to have, especially if you're working in the summer. Okay. White, more passive as a reflector. Where'd my clicker go? More passive as a reflector, but works pretty well. I like to use silver, my translucent scrims, and white. And black, of course. Okay. Questions on reflectors. Remember, we have two impact silver and white reflectors to give out yet. All right. Yes, sir. I wasn't sure. For this shot here, where did you hold the reflector? Is it it's sitting right above her. And see where the shadow is underneath the chin? So how, how high is the building behind her? Is this is actually on a rooftop. Oh, okay. So it's not terribly high, to, but, but make a long story short is, I want to say it's another three feet above her. Oh, so then you are catching light that's... That's exactly. And look again where the shadow's falling. Okay. And what that translucent scrim did is help create surface area. It basically got that hot spot from the sun and spread it out over a five foot span. It softens it up. It softens it up. It's an easy kill. Okay. Yeah. If you want to use less light, if you want to get rid of the light, if it was really, 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 really bright, and I wanted less, less light, I would control it with my shutter. Use black if you want to get rid of the light completely for subtractive lighting. If you want to create shadow, 
If you want to create shadow. Let's say, again, I'm standing, this is a huge white building, which, you know, you're standing there, and I want to get my picture taken in front of that other building that's way off in the distance. But this building right here is just creating such a hot spot that I can't even get exposure to my big building back there. Put a black scrim right here or a black reflector, and what it's going to do, it's going to take away the light, subtractive lighting. It's funny because as photographers, we always think of, no, we've got to add more light, we've got to add more light, we've got to add more light. But in reality, sometimes we just got to take away a little bit of the sugar, just a little bit. It's important. We're thinking in ratios. We're thinking in the big threes, okay? On the, on the beach, you would use black. Black is, oh, good man, yeah, good man. In the beach, black, you got to use it. What happens on the beach? Everybody's like this. Most guys take out silver because they feel as though they need to add more light so they can underexpose the sky a little bit. Use black. It'd be so much easier. Control the sky by your shutter. When you're going into the situation with that woman with the, that you just showed. Yeah, yeah. Now, you're at the, you're on location there. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Ah, thank you. When you take that shot, do I look at my subject and get back to the culture? Do I look at my background? Because you use the... Um, so mm -hmm. But what made you think that in your mind's eye? What were you thinking to get that type of work? Well, I'll be very honest with you. I, we storyboard everything. I'm a bit of a control freak like all of you, and don't, don't deny it. <laughs> Photographers are a bit of a control freak. We storyboard everything before we go on set. We knew that she was going to stand there in front of there. My job as a photographer, I'm not a retoucher. Uh, you know, I don't do makeup. I don't do hair. I don't do fashion styling. I do light and focus. When I go on the set, I do light and focus. What's light and focus? The big three. Thank you. Essentially, it's the big three, and that's my job when I get out there. So basically, we had this set up. You know, I, I'm giving you the nitty gritty. My job is just to make sure it's well lit, that the product looks good. It was about the coat in this case. You know, that, that's really it. So do you remember what the aperture uh, was on that shot? It was like, it was like an F-22. Like one over 250, or maybe even higher. Get the exposure, right? Yeah, because it was shot. That was shot Labor Day about three years ago, and I remember it was so bright up there. You know, I want I wanted sunglasses for my sunglasses, and we were just all whoa. Right, and then you chose the translucent for what reason? Again? For one reason to diffuse the sun. Basically, the sun in July, well, Labor Day, you know, it's 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 just a pinpoint. You you know, you're dealing with a torch. The job is to create surface area to soften the light, diffuse the light. A cloud would have been wonderful, but I don't have that kind of, I don't have that kind of power. <laughs> you know, just, yeah. <laughs> okay, what's next, guys? But the effect of the diffuser is on everything that's in that shot? Or just that's correct. That's correct. It's a five-foot diffuser. I use something just about twice the size of this little guy and just put it over there. Boom. That's it. And it's shot just a, just a drop wide. I don't know if you can tell, but it's not actually that wide. This is my, go ahead, sir, please, and I'll get into this. I did the sun. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No artificial light. Well put. This one right here is the OctaCool with a reflector on the bottom. Now keep in mind, I have one of my guys holding the OctaCool right above her. See where the the shadow is falling be below the chin? Think of your light source. That's where the light's coming from. And I have nothing but a large reflector sitting over here and a silver one right here. Boom. Because this material is very dark. But see where the shadow is falling? Super easy. Easy, easy. Why didn't we use strobes in this place? The guy who owns this place was really particular about what we were plugging into the walls. And for some reason, this, the flash has freaked him out. And great location, great models, great stylus, crazy landlord. What do you do? You deal with it. You got to make way. And this is why, you know, you get onto a set or whatever, don't make excuses. Just get your shot. Go in there, light and focus. If you know your big threes, this is easy. Okay? Questions, comments? Yeah. It would have, we would have lost detail. What would happen to the, to the model as well? Right here, we would have lost a lot of detail as well. See, some of the specularity that you see off of her, it's, it's coming from a nice silver little splash of light. You know, and we can, we'd move it in. And what I tend to do is, you know, it's not an exact science. You know, I'll move it in an inch, move it in an inch more, move it in an inch more, and then I see it in the frame, and then I'll have them back off a millimeter, and then we shoot another one. Just so we get different variations, you know, later. Light, 
you're not going to have the same results. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. No. Reason being is because two lights won't give you the contouring here. If I would have added another light, she, the light would have lit her just as well as the, her left side. It would have been too flat. And flat lighting is what type, what ratio of lighting? One to one. Thank you. One to one, exactly. This is more of a two to one, right? Background being twice as dark. That's correct, sir. Yeah. No, it's actually on the right side. On the right? Yeah. See? Yeah, her left, exactly. Her left. That's correct. Good man. You see it, exactly. So what size is the reflector? Uh that's a big one. I want to say that was a six by six, six foot by six foot reflector. And there's a lot of different manufacturers that make extremely large reflectors. When in doubt, and you don't know where to buy light, if you're thinking, should I buy a flash? Should I buy a, an octacool? Should I buy the Impact Mini Light Trek? Buy a 10-foot reflector. That's what I would buy. That's going to give you more useful, attainable light on the go. And more importantly, you're going to become very intuitive of how to carve out your light. Yes, sir? You could do that. You could do that, but you know, quite honestly, what happens with reflectors, it just gives you that instant gratification. You're like, ah, oh, I see it. Back off, get out of the way, and you dick your shot. Well, you'd have to meter it, and then you're adding time to your, your set, you know. Often when we get in there to the set, you know, we're dealing with time and money. More importantly, you know, we have 20 minutes to shoot in this room, and the model's not even ready. You know, you're like, ooh, I'm freaking out. I just want to get the shot so I can move on and keep my head up. But you make a good point. Absolutely, that's definitely an option. But a reflector gives that immediate gratification. This is why I say if you're going to make an investment, buy a reflector, because you're going to see it from the get-go. Yeah. Question. Um, you said not to use the one-to-one -one lighting. It, I didn't say no. No, no. I said if, you're doing, if, if you need to get your mug shot done, definitely use a mug. No, one -to -one. I'm talking about for this shot. That's you correct. would not have used it. If, if you did, would it potentially widen? widen no, it wouldn't it? widen her out. It would flatten it out. It would be less contouring. See, as, 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 again, as humans, we're used to seeing shadow. But as technicians, we want to get rid of it. You know, we, you need to start thinking and go outside. You know, after you leave here, look at every nuance of light and notice the shadow behind it. If you don't have shadow, you don't have contouring. Essentially, your subject's no longer alive. My two cents. Um, is it right? Nah. Is it wrong? No. Rim light. <clears throat> Essentially, a rim light is nothing more than a hair light. Again, back to the 80s, late 70s, 80s. Rim light was practiced because it al allowed you to separate your subject from your background. Olin Mills, J.C. Penney's, Sears, loves a hair light. Does Joey? No. <laughs> I can't practice a hair light. <clears throat> I was trained by some, of the some very good portrait photographers who practiced that. But again, I was encouraged to follow my own heart, to follow my own passion and more importantly, to follow my own vision. Um, so a rim light, again, nothing more. Where do we set up our octobank real quick? 45. In this case, we're using a 2 to 1 ratio on our reflect, a beaded reflector. A beaded reflector, in essence, is going to give you a nice reflection of light. I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes as well. But if you really look at a beaded surface, there's something very inherently curious about it. One, it's silver. Okay, so it's going to give us a more of a one-to-one -one reflection value. That we can accept. What's extremely unique about this monster is that as the light hits it, it begins to scatter the light. It begins to diffuse the light from the get-go. What happens when light becomes diffused? You get more surface area. More surface area means this light's going to be just a drop softer. So what this monster has, it has high efficiency in its throwback of light, but and also high contrast, by the way. But beyond that, it's also adding a little diffused, a little soft light to it. So it's an extreme efficient way of getting light back onto your subject, a soft light, without losing light. Because inherently, umbrellas are extremely inefficient. But that's part of their charm, and I'll get into that real quick as well. So what we have here is we have the silver beaded reflector, which I showed you back here. Let's bounce back one. The Octocool does include a silver beaded reflector, which allows for a good rim light, or if you want to use it, a hard light, maybe a separation light. And that's usually used at 30 degrees or 60 degrees, depending on your subject. 
You'll see on my next example, I could not do the hair. I had to do the back of the neck, the rim. Um, I think she has a nice neck, so I figured, why not separate her from the background just like that? This was set right around 35, maybe 40 degrees from the subject, away in the back. My primary light at 45 degrees, we're done. Easy, easy, easy. Three feet too as well. Every, and how high was the light above the eye? 20 degrees. So that was a silver reflector? That's correct. On the rear. On, on the, the back. back yeah. That's correct. Silver beaded uh, hitting her in the back. Yes? That's correct. If you're doing realtor shots, um, head shots or whatnot, sometimes continuous light does help because often these people are not used to camera flashes or whatnot. It's an easier way to catch, capture them while maybe you're discussing something or whatnot. Uh, entirely up to you, but you're right. You, you can get away with that shutter speed. Um, quick question about your main light and the red light. Mm -hmm. Good question. What do you think? What is the ratio between the rim light and our main light? Something that I neglected here, and forgive me, a good rim light or hair light should be a two to one ratio to your primary subject. That is, if my octacool is set at f8, what is my rim light set at? Thank you, f11. Twice the light. Because then you're not blowing out your highlights. But more importantly, you're getting a nice separation. Twice the light, one stop. See, just look at our primary, primary light here and look at how, how specular this is right here, how reflective it is. It's twice the light. I'm sorry? It's slightly getting blown out, but that's what you want. That's a, that's a hair light, that's twice the light. You know, that's a rim light, it's separating her. And again, that's very subjective. This is why I don't practice, I don't do the hair light well. No, no, please, very good question. Um, so what, I, I'm a little confused, so what light you are exactly using? The rim light is used with an octacool. Oh, without the soft spots, with the... As you see here on the left, as you see here on the, that's correct. The, the two lights Indeed, lights. yep. Comes with everything but a camera and a computer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the model's not included. I'm sorry about that, buddy. <laughs> yeah, no stylus. <clears throat> but it doesn't come included with the kit, absolutely. And it's usually, again, use it sparingly. It's very subjective, however you want to use it. Uh, two to one ratio. Now, again, Joey Quintero does not like a hair light. So I did this hair salon gig mm, about three years, two years ago. And hair salons, it's all about the hair. You know, what do they want? I want to see the hair. I want to see it in motion. <clears throat> Make a long story short is, I need a hair light, Joey. We need a little more separation. I need to see what's going on. I said, well, can I play with different ideas? Why don't you just put the hair, the hair light above the hair? I said, no, we can't do that. I, I'll, you'll see me in my grave this evening. So I started playing with my assistants, and we started playing with different exposures. And we had like five minutes to come up with this. This is my rendition of a hair light. It's fun. It's a little different. It's showing the hair. And more importantly, bow, it gives it energy. Uh, we did a whole series like this with Tara at the, for the salon. And, he ended up liking them a lot, which I was very pleased because I got to stick to my artistic rendition, and more importantly, I made the customer happy. Did you use uh, comb lights? I'm sorry? Did you use highlight? Uh, the hair light. Hair light. No, no. Stuck with my own, my own. Uh, as they say, I stuck to my guns. So what, what is that look? What is that? In the background, very good question. That is shot with a continuous light. Okay, so I have my continuous light set at. How, how high above the eye? 20 degrees above the eye. That background light, since I'm shooting with tungsten light, I had the light balance for tungsten light. So now if I add flash to it, what happens to flash? Do you guys familiar with the color wheel? Yeah. Yeah. Go back and get it. Go back and get your color wheel. Start studying the color wheel. The primary colors, secondary colors, and tertiary colors, you need to start studying as artists. Because what happens on the opposite end of the color wheel on tungsten, it's blue. So if the camera sees yellow as white, it's going to see that flash as blue. And these are ways of using your tools, utilizing your tools. The color wheel, second grade. Subtractive, that's subtractive coloring. Subtractive coloring, exactly. Exactly. With 
these type of lights you're talking about, can you do continuous? And then you can say, well, now I'm going to try both with flash. You can, absolutely. And I use both here. This is flash and continuous at the same, same trigger. The only thing, again, is I was bound by my shutter speed, which is fine because she's not really moving. You know, I just had my guy move that flash in and around the shot. That's correct. That's correct. So essentially, she's being shot at like 3,200K, 3,200 Kelvin. If you're not familiar with Kelvin, that's coming in the second class of this series. And it gets really heavy. And I suggest buy a color wheel before then. Um, <clears throat> and then what we did is we, we had the flash shoot at 5,500 Kelvin, 5,000 Kelvin. And what happened is it contaminated our shot, which turns out blue. That's, in essence, that's es essentially it. No, the camera said at 32. Yes. And then it's getting her correctly, uh, She's correctly balanced. Is that because the camera's at 55? No. No. Think about what's happening here. If you put a yellow light on me right now, a yellow light, a tungsten light, which is 3,200 Kelvin, we can all agree with that. OK? What happens if I hit myself with a, if I get, if I see a flash in the background? That's going to inherently show a blue. Think of the color wheel. That's correct. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. That's why the flash is blue. If you want a really, really good book, Digital Photography by Henry Hornstein. I just had my picture taken with him very recently. Very excited about that. And he signed my very first photo book on top of that. Henry Hornstein, Digital Photography. He writes the Bible behind photo books. Every college and university that has a formal formal type of matriculation and photography courses, you utilize Henry Hornstein. Henry Hornstein, digital photography. He talks about it extensively. So is there a difference <coughs> between backlighting and hair light? Ooh, the question is, is there a difference between backlighting and hair light? I would say yes, because of what I did with this shot right here, this is good, this is backlighting. Essentially, this is backlighting. And that's hair, that's a hair light, you know. And again, Backlighting is used to separate your subject from the background. Hair lighting is to give what, what, what people used to say is add glamour to the shot. A halo, exactly. If you're really interested in the hair light concept, Monty Zucker. Monty Zucker, Dean Collins, these are huge names in the 80s who, uh, you may not like their particular style of photography, but the fundamentals are so, so good. Yeah, right? You have a question? No, actually, it's about three inches. She was like, oof, yeah. Oh, she felt the pop. Three inches. I have it literally right there. Only because we need to do something fun, and you know, and I'm just building, yeah. Questions? Yes? Is that a naked strobe in the back? That's a naked strobe in the back. That's a lens flare. Yeah. They call that art. When you when you do it accidentally, they call that that's a happy accident. <laughs> they didn't they didn't even they don't yeah didn't even notice it didn't even, yeah, didn't even come up. I noticed it like a year later, quite honestly. Yeah. And again, it's you know there's no rights or wrongs here. You know, yeah. Good observation too, by the way. Okay, light meter tips. Juggle the big three. That is aperture, shutter, and ISO. If you want to be a good photographer, you're going to have to master those three. <clears throat> now, we got into the to start talking about a light meter. Now we're going to start talking about it into studio strobes and whatnot. We're going to get very specific about umbrellas and soft boxes and beauty dishes. Now, a light meter is nothing more than a speedometer for light. It's going to give you a relative f-stop of what you should be setting your camera at when the flash is popped. Now, I used the analogy earlier. If you're on the interstate. You're going 75 and you don't have a speedometer. You have a feeling what 75 is, but until you really look down at your speedometer, you really don't know. The same thing with light. Let's face it, light is physics. There's some exactness to it. In the day, I used to try to study my histograms and try to get an idea with that, but I found out that my digital tech was just, it was just driving him crazy. Because what, what you see in the camera and what you finally get to your final workflow are two different things two different monsters, two different profiles. 
it's good to get a very good solid exposure with a tool that you know every time. The Siconic 308 is a relatively cheap, accurate light meter. Um, I bounce around between di different, uh, we, oh God, last time we used Hector, which is with, uh, he's with data color. I want to say he's with data color. Is he in data color now? Yeah, he's with data color. And he bounces around between two different light meters, and he uses two light meters to get a relative f-stop for us. That's how exact he wants to do. He wants to be very exact, so when he gets that data, takes it into Lightroom, he can make the adjustments or white balances accordingly. Um, everybody has their own method, no right, no wrong. What I suggest is study it, or maybe not get into it at all. I don't do a lot of digital teching. I am a photographer. I do light in focus. I study the big threes. That's what Joey does. Now, my two, my tips here as far as using a light meter is always meter your subject on the same plane. That is, if I'm going to shoot Joey and I'm going to pop my flash here, I don't put the meter here, I don't put it there, I don't put it there, I put it right on my nose, right here, boom. Reason being is because this is where the lens is going to, this is where the lens is going to focus on Joey, right here, okay? That's where the light's going to fall. Light knows the difference between here and here, but here, that's where the lens is. Meter on the same plane as your subject. Beyond that, ensure that the globe is directed towards your light source, okay? If the light is here, as it is here, I'm not pointing it over there, I'm not pointing it over there. Oh, it's not right here, it's right there. I need to know the relative value of my light so I can make the proper adjustments, so I can try to get as accurate as possible. When working with multiple lights, always pick your main light source. This is something that I covered very, very briefly on the one to two ratio. That is, you have to make sure that you treat every part of your composition as a primary subject. We have Joey, we want a nice white background. We're gonna first meter Joey at F11. I love F11, everything's sharp. Boom, we pop, we bring the lights up or down to, to get our F11, and then we make sure we get our F16 in the background. I'm the main subject of this photograph. I'm setting the camera for Joey at F11. F11, F16 equals a nice high key shot, okay? Uh, remember, the light meter is nothing more than a tool. These are tools, these are extensions. This is why Joey doesn't buy a camera. I haven't bought a camera since the 10D, and how long ago was that? 19, uh, 2001. 2001, that was my last camera, because I'm not buying into it. Reason being is they change every six months. Secondly is I, I tend to lease or rent cameras. They go on a job-to-job -job basis because every job that we're shooting, they want, they, want, they, want, they want either bigger or they want smaller. So why rent a RV to go to the convenience store when all you need to do is a realtor's headshot for that day? It just doesn't make any sense. So um, I stopped buying cameras for that reason. But I do have some very good lighting tools. Um, I do have an old, old light meter that I carry with me when I'm doing my own stuff or whatnot. And again, they're just extensions of what you see up there and what you want here to apply it to your camera. This helps you master the big threes, guys. The big threes. Um, when you're, if you're treating your background as a subject, where do you place your If I'm treating my background as a subject, which you should do in this case, I usually, we'll use, uh, God, I forgot her name. Kate, we'll use Kate as a background, as our, Kate's right here. We already got our F11, pop, pop. We got our F11, Kate's happy. At this point in the game, the camera is gonna be shooting Kate from this distance. I'm setting my meter here and then popping my lights onto the background. Kate's right here. I'm metering behind her because I wanna know what the camera's gonna see at that point. <coughs> Again, basing everything off of my main subject, which in this case is Kate or Joey, boom, F16. I, essentially what I said is I, I pay attention to where the camera position is. Okay, if I'm shooting Kate, again, camera's right over here. Boom. Meter's here. Because I want to know what the camera's going to see. I want to know what the exposure of the camera's going to be like. The light? Oh, the light? It, well, in this case, in this case, particular case, what I did is I put two lights at 45 degree angle right here on that background. That's a very typical high key background. You can use one line and get away with it with silver reflect, uh, umbrellas, and I'll get into that really, really quickly here. 
But again, very subjective depending on what you're looking for. Questions, comments, guys? I usually use 100 or 50. Never go above 100. I'm, I'm from the old school where if you went anything above 200, 300, it meant grainy stuff. Questions? Yeah. Basically, are we talking about three ratios? The highlight and the fade, the low light and the Technically speaking, yes. It's a very good observation. Ba <coughs> right, but you, you, at this point in the game, when, when, what you're talking about is contouring. And, and it's very observant of you. And that's what we're going to handle in, in our th second and third classes, is start getting into really molding the light. But you're still talking about these ratios, two to one, three to one. Is that, it the background and the subject? It's just, or is it the highlight and the low light? It's essentially just the subject and the background, in this case, for this class. But it's, good eye. It's very observant of you. No, no, it's good. I'm sorry. Uh, OK. Again, the Siconic 308 is a great little light meter. Doesn't cost you a lot. I think the PDN has a show special right now at B&H and Adoram and other of our competitors. But beyond that, it's a great tool. Um, the 308 DC offers uh, a more of a cinematic approach. So if you're into video as well as photo, I recommend something like that. It'll it gives you um, I can't remember the measurement. Forgive me here, but uh, economic won't break the bank, and you'll have it forever. Um, some, of the, some of my tools, and I've always told people, make sure that you buy your photo tools that'll outlast your camera and your computer. Because let's face it, your, your computer you're going to replace every three to four years-ish, and your camera you're going to replace every five years, probably. You know, and I've had some, I've had my 708 since 11th grade. Okay. This is Hector. He works for Data Color, and he does our digital uh, he's our digital tech. And essentially what he's doing here, I just wanted to touch on, like what is it? Like yeah, right? Essentially what he's doing here is he's essentially getting our white balance, getting a good exposure so I can get an idea of where to set the camera. And I'm popping the flash on him. And then on top of that, he's using that uh, color checker to make sure that our white balance is on the money. Uh, that is skin tone, uh, the gown, whatever. They look much better here than on that. Make a long story short is, that contraption that he has here, he's going to zoom into it in Lightroom and then use the eyedropper to extract different information points from it. That's exactly it. <clears throat> and if you kind of recognize Hector, he gave several lectures during the PDN Expo uh, that we just passed this last weekend. And quite proud of him. He's come a long way, I'll tell you that. Now, this is the final shot from that, uh, that, uh, that measure measurement there. But uh, you can see it came out pretty good. Uh, the skin tone's on the money. The, it was very important that that color of that gown that she's wearing, that was a particular color. And we had to shoot it two different times because either it was too dark or it was too saturated. Here is closer than the screens here. Um, beyond that, this is Kelly, same day, um, same exposure. And if you notice here, let's go back one. If you notice here, I'm practicing a little two to one ratio myself. Look at the highlight on her elbows and her arms and her legs. That's a little bit of specularity. So what we did when we essentially started metering her, I had to shoot her at like an F11 because what? I wanted everything sharp. It's, everything's got to be sharp. One, for the retoucher. Secondly, because I got to make sure that I show the accessories, the shoes, the hair. Everything's got to be sharp. So what I did is I jumped out about 20 feet down the street, and I took another ambient meter reading on that. And what I did is if she shot at F11, and I kind of want a two to one ratio, but I'm not quite sure of how much I want to rim on her because I need a little separation on her, just a drop of separation, just so you can see a little bit of three dimensionality. Technically, the background should have been an F16, technically. But what I did is I went into thirds, which most of the digital, digital camera shooting now is in, in thirds. So what I did is this is almost a two to one ratio, but not quite, by, sh by jimming it down to third. When did you measure the background? Where? Where? I just walked down the street and just put it on my head. In the middle of the street? Yeah. No, in the middle of the street, because that's essentially it. You know, it's just like landscape photographers. A landscape photographer wants to shoot the Grand Canyon. He doesn't go all the way to the other side of the canyon. <laughs> he kind of gets a feeling of what the light is all around, because God is very generous in that regard. You didn't use reflective? No, no. I just use the globe, the same, same method. Yeah. Let's try to keep it uh, consistent. That's correct, sir. Yep. If it was a dark, it was like a shady in the back. You couldn't get that. Uh, that's exactly it. 
And you know what I really wanted? If you notice very carefully on the upper left-hand corner, look how muddy and gray it is that day. And they kept saying, we want a blue sky with the city. I see the girl walking down. And this is on 27th Street, so it's very cobblestone-ish. And uh, they wanted her walking down the street, bright blue sky, because on the other side, you know, the, uh, the West Side Highways, and you can kind of see that skyscape. I figured we're going to get the shot. Soon enough, um, Saturday rolls around, and it's nothing but a gray sky. So what I had to do, just to, again, practicing an artistic deal, is I put her in front of this building, practiced a little two-to-one ratio, and it got a nice little three-dimensional shot out of it. It works. It wasn't what we wanted, but I, I'm 90% there. So you were pointing the meter down the street away from her? That's correct. And, and, you know, exactly, like the gentleman said back here. Yes, sir? No, I used to, that was shot with a 24 to 70. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ish. I want to say ish. She's, sitting, she's standing on an so, uh, apple box. An apple box is nothing more than a, a cube about yay big. And I'm literally laying on the ground. My head is on the ground shooting upward. Can you, uh, when you're on the location, can you, do you use a JPEG to fine tune or do you use a, I'd like you, you want to go with a raw, to fine tune the uh, white balance? Never shoot JPEG. Never. Never. Yeah. I wish you were wrong. You can shoot JPEG. Will Crockett, who I have a lot of respect for and is a mentor of mine, and, and I like to say a good friend, he shoots a lot of JPEG because he's proving to the populace, the, the grand masses, that he can get it in one shot with one JPEG. And he does. Wow. Yeah. And it's the perfect profile. Um, very few of us are that good. I need raw because I need a digital negative and I need some tweaking after the fact. More importantly, I, I work with retouchers and it's usually not my decision. You know, I, again, Joey's light and focus, the big threes, that's it. Yeah, and I got somebody telling me how to frame this up too yeah. on top of that. What's the supplemental lighting in there? That is shot with a seven foot umbrella by Profoto and with a Pro, uh, Pro 7B pack, which is a, essentially it's a, it's a DC powered pack, 1200 watt seconds. Allows me to shoot anywhere on the moon, on the shore, and on the street. Yes? One light? One light. Actually, two. We've got the sun in the background kind of spilling in. But good question. And there's Kelly. Same method. You can see a little bit of rimming on her legs, a little bit on the, on the, on the arms there. Studio flash. This is a great example of a monoblock. Essentially, a monoblock is nothing more than a self contained unit daylight balanced. Again, strobe units offer a much longer stroke as far as your gas pedal goes. You get a little more options. You don't have to deal with shutter speed so much. Affordable B&H kit there. Okay, setting up our studio strobe umbrella at how high? And a reflector at? Very good guys. Start there. It's not gospel, but start there. Now we're going to start getting, I could get this whole contention about shooting through an umbrella or reflective umbrella or whether it should be a silver umbrella. Um, let's cover this real quick here. Essentially all we have is a 45 degree angle, 20 degrees above the eye, 45 degrees to her left. Easy, easy, easy. It's an easy kill. And what the first thing we did is I metered her, I shot her, I want to say this is like at 5'6", about three feet away from the subject, boom, we're done. That easy. And you can get more creative or less creative depending on what you want to do. But it's a great example of a very simple setup that most everyone, if you're a little bit afraid of strobes, start at that 45 to 45 reflector, 20 degrees above the eye, and do accurate meter readings. And before long, it'll be like riding a bike. The, high, the reflector is just sitting about, I want to say, almost level to her face, ish. And that's subjective because everybody's face is different. We're all individuals. Now, yeah. Yes. Not enough power for me, quite honestly. And more importantly, there's less, less control over them. And what I mean by that is you're using a very small light source. When I worked in the lighting department, some guy, guys would come in, and this is, this is the God honest truth. Guys would come in with a W magazine. You're familiar with W magazine, very high-end fashion mag. Come in with the W magazine. They have their Nikon with their Nikon flash and say, how do I get that shot with this camera? And I said, blood, sweat, and tears, buddy. Blood, sweat, and tears. The thing about it is, it's a great tool, but it's not the right tool for every, every job. 
And that's what I really what I'm trying to emphasize here. It's a great tool for events. Some guys do miracles with it. I always use the example is I have a great roofing hammer at the house. Whenever I need to pound up my my uh, oh, a fascia boards or whatnot, it's a great hammer. You know, every season I'm up there. But the difference between me handling that hammer and a framer, a guy who builds houses, is the difference for me between me smashing my thumb and a guy building a house with it. They're just tools. It's a good tool for a lot of, a lot of instances, but it's not for everything. Um, I don't own, like I said, I don't own a camera or, or an on-camera flash, something like that, but if some of my colleagues do incredible work with them. And I think if you're gonna go in that route, invest wisely and find out if it's the right tool for you, you know? I mean, I, don't, I hate to say there's a right or wrong in photography because it's an art. Who's to say that Van Gogh was better than Rembrandt? Questions? Now, let's get into umbrellas. I'm very biased when it comes to umbrellas. Reason being is because I tend to use a shoot through about 80% of the time. One, because it's an extremely inefficient light source, okay? This thing loses light like you wouldn't believe. It's like having a cup of water with a hole in the bottom. You gotta drink it really quick, and it's cheap. It, it does the job though, but let me tell you why. You can shoot through it, okay, and use it as diffusion. We used to call this back in the day a poor man's softbox, because all it's doing is creating surface area for you. The downside is it's extremely efficient with the light. Light is throwing everywhere. So what that means is you have a very small sweet spot. When you're shooting a subject, uh, Colleen here, for example, this is shot with a larger umbrella at a distance. I don't know if this is too reflective, it probably is. Larger umbrella at a distance. But the only downside to it is you have a very small sweet spot. You gotta make sure that you come in very close to your subject. Sure. Uh, uh, forgive me. Okay, very small sweet spot, but it's a very, very inefficient light source. Ooh, here we go. Now let me get into that super quick here. If you recall, the best light is at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, right? Something about that light, they call it the magic hour. You know, it's really soft. It's diffused very nicely. It tends to be a little more warmer. That's subjective. But the same thing happens with an umbrella. I depend on the inefficiency and that stray light. Think of the sun where it, it's positioned at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. Really think about it. It's low on the horizon. It's not aiming right at you. It's aiming way down there and it's actually aiming everywhere else except for you. But it's such a beautiful light because that's stray light. That's the inefficiency light loss that the sun is giving you back. Hence, the umbrella. We are depending on the inefficiency, the stray light that the umbrella is throwing off to give you that sweet light. I never, ever, ever aim the light directly at my subject. If I were gonna shoot Joey today with this umbrella, I'd probably aim it like this. And camera's over there, umbrella's there, and I'm depending on this inefficiency of light to splash onto me right here. That's gonna give me that stray light that makes people look really good. Again beginning of the day or at the end of the day is stray inefficient light and it tends to be the most pleasing. That is if you're doing portraits or whatnot. Yes, that's a good place to start. Always start there. Absolutely. You always want the, the light coming from above, always. As homo sapiens, we have to see light from above. Nothing wrong with light coming from below, but it gives it a different effect. So if you want to see the umbrella, you light it Again, a subjective. Depending on my subject matter. I always tend to start a little above the eye, though. 20 degrees above the eye. Always there. Sometimes it goes up. Sometimes it may come down a little bit. But it's always just a drop above. Another thing about the umbrella that is very charming about it, it's light loss is a charm, okay? It's inefficiency is a charm. It allows you to get that stray light beginning of the day, end of the day, charm. Beyond that, if you want to use it as a reflective source, it's a good way to use that inefficiency as, inefficiency as well. People tend to, you've seen this, we've all seen it, especially with school portraits and whatnot, 
they shoot into the umbrella. What's happening here is it's, it's hitting the umbrella and creating a mountain of light everywhere. This creates a larger sweet spot. It's creating larger surface area. This is why most school photographers tend to use two umbrellas because instead of having an umbrella that's very inefficient that shoots through and you only have like three feet of sweet spot, use it as a reflective source and now you have nine feet of sweet spot. Yeah, you're using, losing a little bit of light, but all umbrellas, if you notice carefully, they have a very sh good sheen in the middle there. And it kind of makes it a drop more efficient, but again, its inefficiency is, is part of its charm. Uh, and on top of that, my biggest love for umbrellas are, yeah? In that case, why don't you just go with the I'm glad you're going there. One more thing I want to say before I get into that. A white translucent umbrella can be bought for as cheap as $10. You break this on set, it's a beer. doesn't matter. Buy three or four of these, use them, abuse them. It's not breaking the bank, and you're getting sweet light out of it. It's a very inexpensive way to get very, very pleasing light, and it costs you nothing, almost. Um, good question about the silver beaded. Now, as I said before on the silver reflector, extremely efficient less light loss, and it's diffusing it from the get-go. This is very much, this is how a beauty dish was designed as well. Essentially what they did is, you have a almost one-to-one -one surface, it's diffusing the light from the get-go, but it's a soft light. Because it's silver, it tends to be inherently more, a little more contrasty. So if you need a little more contrast, you need a little more soft light, and you don't want to lose any light, because if you're using a speed light, you need to be extremely efficient on your light loss. Right? Very subjective. That shot of the girl in the street with the pink uh, top on or whatever, that was shot with the Pro Photo silver beaded umbrella. Because it's, it's super big, it's seven foot, it's extremely efficient, and there's little light loss. Something like this is going to cost you a little bit more though. These start in the $40 range. And I know Pro Photos runs $300. The seven footer runs you $1,300. Very expensive. And this is why you take care of these, and the white ones, you're kind of a little, you're a little less uh, worried about them getting damaged. Who makes that one? That's made by Impact. We designed that one about three, four years ago. We, we're coming up with a whole line of them. We may be doing a, a silver beaded seven footer, but we're not quite sure if it's needed, because there's other manufacturers that do that better, I think. But again, very subjective. Questions, comments? That if, uh, yes, if you're doing, good question. If you're doing uh, school portrait photography, they tend to be both set the same. It's more flat. And if you notice very carefully, most student portraits are very flat. Yeah. But again, that's, you know, and they usually use the hair light or a background light. It, it, it does seem to be changing. Yeah, in New York, exactly. Depending on the, the area. But you make a very good point. Yes, sir. If you wish, absolutely. Depending on your subject, absolutely. That's very common. Back to the two umbrellas, yeah. That's another way of getting a two to one light, lighting ratio. But now we're getting into contouring. Okay. That's what this gentleman was talking about earlier. Okay. It, but you, you make a very good point, and that's going to be in the next class. Okay. Yeah, okay. contouring is a whole other monster because every subject matter is different. And the way you light a, a friend of mine shot cars for years in Detroit before that whole market left. Um, and he's, he made a very good point. There's, the way you would shoot a Chevrolet is so much different than you, the way you would shoot a, an RV. You know? But at the same time, you want to make sure that the contouring is there, that the lines are there. Because they both have you know, respectable engineers that, want to be how, that have a need for it to be shot. So I mean, yeah. Questions, comments? Now, this is my umbrella set up. Same salon, same day with uh, Tara. No, no, this is, a, this is a separate year, second year. Make a long story short is, there I am using my white shoot-through umbrella, translucent, and what was happening is, is I pulled out the reflector because I noticed the reflector was starting to show in her, in her eyes. As we were shooting into the computer, my guy says, stop, you gotta move the light. Why? Because the umbrella's in the shot. Ooh. 
one of the hairdressers says, no, let's leave it in. No, let's take it out. So we left it in. Make a long story short is um, you can see how wonderful it is wrapping around our, our model there. And on top of that, I'm also using it to light my background. Now again, I'm going to show you how we set this up. Look at the way the light is on our subject. I want to say that's a little above 20 degrees. Would you say above the eye? And probably just a little more closer to 30 degrees as far as the plane goes. Look at what's sitting on the sunglasses. So if, if I am, I forgot her name. Her name's, uh, it's probably about right here when we're shooting it. Right there. Now look at me, I'm the subject. Look where the umbrella is. It's probably right there. It's very close. Extremely inefficient, but nice coverage, very soft. Okay. One light source, that's correct. Lit up the background as well. No reflector in this shot. I pulled it out because you can see it in the, in the sunglasses on this particular shot. The position of the light inside the umbrella is always towards the middle of the umbrella, regardless of how you... Yep, good question. I like that. Now, depending on your light source... Oop, oop, oop. Let's take off the reflector a bit quicker. Depending on your light source now, it's entirely up to, ooh, what's going on here? Okay, we're just going to rig it here like that. Okay. I usually start about right here. Reason being, because usually there's an umbrella reflector. Different manufacturers make different umbrella reflectors with different um, angles of spread. Usually they're like this, okay? Usually with silver beaded, it's got a grid, little, little grid reflector. This is normally about 30 to 45 degree spread of light. You can choke it up or choke it back, depending on what you want to do. I tend to use it right in the middle at some point, and it's for the obvious reasons that I don't want to bend the shaft prematurely going this way or that way. But I've learned to work with a lot of multiple light sources with multiple umbrellas by putting it right in the middle, and it works for me. Um, I stick to it, and again, it's my art, my decision, and I'm sure you'll find the same thing for yourselves. Questions? Where'd my clicker go? There we go. Softboxes. Uh, okay, why use a softbox? Softboxes give you directional quality. When you need directional quality, use a softbox. Now, back when there were real painters and real artists like Rembrandt and Van Gogh, they used windows as their primary light source long before Edison, and essentially what we did here in photography is we mimicked a window light with a softbox. And essentially what we're doing here is we have a, a bare head strobe, something like that we have over here, goes inside, and the essence behind it is it hits this primary baffle, and what that primary baffle does, it catches the light and it begins to diffuse it, okay? It bounces around the box some more, creating surface area, and then we have this secondary, or as an exterior baffle, we call it, and that actually adds as a, the cherry on top as far as its softness goes. Now, directional quality, a soft light, think soft boxes. In addition to soft boxes, as far as accessories go, they make a grid for this little guy. And it's nothing more than an egg crate. Think of an egg crate that goes on the exterior portion of this exterior baffle here. And what it does, it gives you very finite directional quality. So if I just want my subject, my subject to be lit, just Jeff, I can really hone the light down. Unlike an umbrella. Remember, if I want this, if I wanted to light just Jeff with an umbrella, I'm lighting up six feet all around him. All around him. And if I too use it as a reflective source, woo, I'm lighting up even more. I'm, exactly. Now with a softbox, it's going to give us directional quality. With an egg crate, I can really pinpoint. Egg crates are sold in different degrees. 50, 60, 30, 10, but they're very pricey, but they're very necessary if you just need to light up one little area, okay? Unlike a grid, go ahead. How many watts do you recommend? That's up to you, what are you lighting? Like, if, you're, if you're shooting, uh, ooh, it depends on your f-stop. See, these are tools, these are, you know, the same way when you buy a car. Do you buy a four-door? Do you need an SUV? Do you need an RV? You want a sports car? You want a Ferrari? You know, I mean, the, you have as many decisions there as you do lights. 
What I suggest you do is, if you can, if you're in the New York City area, is rent as many light sources as you can for yourself. There's a lot of reputable rental houses here in the city. Rent, 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 get to know the equipment. Because again, they're just extensions of you, of what you're trying to create. Um, if you say, I just want to get shots of the girl in front of the white background, well, you know, and, and you want to stick to that, you could probably do that with a speed light, probably. I don't know. You know, depending on, again, finding out the tools that you, that you have. Um, I go back to the hammer. That hammer works great when I want to touch up the fascia board or want to smash cans, but I'm not going to build a house with it. Put it in someone else's hands, they can. I mean, they're, they're just tools. I wouldn't get too, too close to your tools, my two cents, my philosophy. Softboxes again. When you think softboxes, a couple of things come to mind as far as assignments go. I use softboxes when I need one light on a primary subject. I have a, we have a, a 74 by, 54 by 72 softboxes at the studio. We have two big ones. If we ever need to light up a huge set and don't want to deal with umbrellas because of the, the inefficiency of the light, and we only have 1,200 watt seconds on each pack, we need to depend on the efficiency of the softbox. Efficiency, directional quality, soft light, you think softboxes. That's when it's time to invest in a softbox. Inefficiency, price, who cares about directional quality? Think umbrellas. Think silver beaded when you need something cheap that's a little more efficient, a little more contrasty, silver beaded um umbrella. Okay, I'm trying to categorize these because they're just tools. You don't use a Phillips head when you need a, <laughs> when you need a, a flat head. They're just tools. Finite differences between our tools here. Okay, no rights, no wrongs though. Okay, again, where are we going to put our softbox? How high above the eye? And a reflector at 45 degrees. Okay, now I always tell people, treat it like a window. When you start setting up a softbox, remember it's going to be a little more directional, just like a window. It's going to give a certain area of light, illumination at a certain area. Utilize that. And if you want to, begin to feather the light. The technique that I recalled to earlier on the umbrella, when I lit my subject, remember the model with the glasses? I'm depending on that inefficiency. It's called feathering the light. Where they got the term, somebody please fill me in. But I've been using this term forever and I've heard a lot of photographers use it. And it's basically using the edge of the light, the inefficiency. Remember, inefficiency of light is the beginning of the day and the end of the day. And the same way, treat the, um, the softbox the same way. Because if you start using your light source is right on your subject, you're going to tend to end up with less contouring. And that's what you were talking about earlier. You're going to end up with, le you're going to end up with more flat light. People need to see contouring. They need to see a little shadowing. Learn how to feather your light just a little bit and play with it. Start with 45, 20 degrees above the eye, 45 degree reflector if you're needed, and then start from there and then move on. Yeah. yeah. That's correct. That's correct. That's exactly it. Think of it very much like a shower head. I have this whole theory about shower heads and, and light. You know, we've all have this nozzle in the yard where you can go extra wide and you can go really sh uh, like a jet stream with it. Light's the very same way. You can go very hard with it and it can be just a spotlight or it can be very diffused and very broad. You kind of have to think light in those terms. Light has the very inherent properties as audio as well. It's everywhere. The only difference between audio and light is you can see light. Audio, you kind of hear it bouncing off the different environment, but kind of practice the same principles. It all applies. Softbox setup, you can see it's a little more directional. I have a nice little reflector on the side. I think, I, I can't remember if I pulled it away on this particular shot, but you can see it just lights up. It's easy cheesy, does the job. This is a softbox setup that we shot in, no, this was shot in central Pennsylvania. I'm sorry? Yes, good eye. Softbox over here, we used a very large softbox. This is a 54 by 72 softbox. And I dragged such a big monster out there because I wanted directional quality. And when you're shooting outdoors, it's hard to depend on that inefficiency that umbrellas don't give you or do give you, depending on how you look at it. So outside, I, I don't, don't want to say I always use a softbox, but I always bring a softbox with me because you never know what the light's like. Now just to give you an example how this was lit, she was shot in F11 again. It's all about the outfit, of course. 
and they also wanted that blue sky. So if I'm shooting, okay, let's di dissect this down into the big threes, guys, okay? Shooting at F11, I walked, oh, maybe about 30 feet back, and you can see the sun, how it's hitting her on the other side, okay? Rule of thumb here is you do not want to have two light sources coming from the same direction just for the, for the sake of believe, it being believable. So I have two different light sources from two different directions. And one is a nice separation, to nice two to one practice there, you can see, nice rim light. And I got some nice contouring from the softbox. But beyond that, what I'm really trying to stress here is the background back there, okay? I took the light meter, okay? I have to shoot in an F11. So that's what my softbox is set at. My strobe is F11. That's concrete. Now, my background is going to be controlled by my shutter speed. That's going to give me my 2 to 1 ratio in this case. Well, since it's very, very blue, I went out there. It was a very bright day, you can see. And I had to depend my, I got F11, so that's done. Check. My shutter speed next. Went out, took a hike, and I found out that like at F11, I'm shooting at 1 over 250, 1 over 200-ish. Boom. So there's two down. ISO is a no-brainer. I'm always shooting at 100. So there's the big threes, and that's how you get a shot like that. Easy. Questions? Comments? Yes? There is no reflector. No. That's the sun. That's the sun. Not blocked by the tree. Which is kind of kind of deceiving, right? It's kind of deceiving. Whatever, four, it's a four shot, you know. Yes, Abe. Uh, so uh, exactly. Yes. Okay. So, I have my light meter set at f11. Right. F11 stuck in the head. Power pack stuck at f11. Model f11. We have to take a height back, and I have to find out what my ambient light is. Words of wisdom that was to, uh, preached to me years ago is you have to base your exposure on the light you cannot control. In this case, Mother Nature is the sun. I cannot control the light back there. So if I run a pretty blue background, I have to base my exposure. In this case, the shutter speed, which is the big number two, aperture we got, shutter speed is going to base my ambient light. That's going to give me the light, the luminosity up or down on my ambient. In other words, the background in this case. I think it was like 1 over 200. What? So why is she not dark? Because the flash popped her. There's a 54 by 72 softbox on there with 1200 watt seconds. Set it F11. You got it? ISO 100. Yeah. Well, you know what, too? It's also a, uh, it's a 54 by 72 softbox. It's huge. You know, and I have it right next to her. It's a, no, no. The bottom of the softbox, I want to say, is sitting probably right, probably, I want to say probably where her hand is. Yeah. You know, give or take. The natural light looks unnatural. The natural light looks unnatural. Thank you. I, believe me, that's, that's a compliment. That's what I want to hear. Because my job is to make sure that it looks as believable as possible. Okay, your first subject is as far as the uh, artificial light. Go ahead. <laughs> your first subject is the grow. You have f11. Now, and I got to ask you about your shutter. Right there. The shutter speed. Well, it's one over two hundred. At the site, right where the girl is. No, right where the girl is is irrelevant. I, I can't worry about that. Reason being is when you're using flash photography. Your camera is going to sync at wherever it wants to, depending on where its max sync speed is. My job here is my primary subject is already lit up with the softbox. F11. You don't, you don't care about your shutter in the beginning? Yes and no. If I'm in the studio, no. It's always set at 1 over 125. Oh, but outside. Outside, yes. I am binding, I am bound by the, by the light that I cannot control. Okay. In this case, it's the ambient light. The light that God is giving us at this particular shot. The shot that Joey's giving this, the, the light that Joey's giving this shot is the power pack. It's a 54 by 72 softbox. We meted her at F11. Boom. That's done. Me, Aperture done. Let me ask you this. Uh, you're thinking in your head, I want a 2 to 1 ratio in the background. Mm -hmm. 
So you're thinking, if you match f11, it's not 2 to 1. But by changing the shutter, you get that 2 to 1. That That's correct. Doing. Because it allows me to control the light. No, it allows me, I'm bound by the light I cannot control. But it allows me just a drop of control by, with my shutter. So it's different Very than limited the, window. It's different than the original indoor one where you went to f16, f11 to f16. That's correct. Now outside, you're doing it. Matching the yes and no. Yes and no. I, you can see there's a definite separation here. The light is not exactly the same. You see what I'm saying here? You see it. She's just a, and, and dare I say this, she's just a drop darker than the background. Just a drop. Just enough to show detail, just enough to add a little mood, and just to add enough joy passion right. so to the shot. You're looking for a little separation. That's correct. The in the background. Again, back to three dimensionality. That's right. our job. In this case, yes. Now, if you went to the shutter, and the flash, of course. The flash. Yeah, you can't control the backlight, but you can control how much flash you get. If you went to 1500, it would be a darker backlight. It'd be extremely dark. Okay. And if you went the other way, it'd be very bright. It'd be bright enough to so whatever you're looking for. And when in doubt, and you're getting out there, and you're like, uh, I don't know what I want to do with the background, then just bracket with your shutter. Bracket with your shutter, and you'll end up with different variations or different light and darknesses of your background. Okay. When in doubt, I know we, that's what we did with this shot. Just, just to cover thy butt. Yeah, I was going to mention like a sinusoid, which is for three times the goal. When you're using a flash, your shutter really controls your ambient light because the power of your flash is controlling the exposure on your subject, you know, well, and your f stop and your flash are what, what is controlling the exposure on your subject. So when you're outside, if you want to make if your background is too dark, then you have to adjust your I couldn't have said it better myself. I wish I had another, I wish I could give you something else. You're good. Thank you. No, that's, sure, please, go ahead. Considering that your soft box is so large, mm -hmm. I noticed that the top of her head and side pockets in the left section photograph, the hair is very dark. Were you using anything? Right here? Uh, no, the opposite side. The left side of the photograph. Uh, up here. Were you using hands? No. 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 No, we kept it simple. When you're shooting a location, one thing is you're on the, always rushed. You're always rushed. And more importantly, um, you want to get it done before we lose light. You know? And we, we started, I want to say we started driving out about 3 in the morning. We didn't get there till like 6 in the morning. They weren't ready to start shooting till 10 in the morning. And then we have 10 outfits to shoot till 4, 5 p.m. You know. Yeah. No, no, in this case I did not. It's a very good question though, but, it, but an afterthought I wish I could have. Patrick Demarchier is a famed fashion photographer. If you ever can, read his bio. He always talks about his, I mean this guy shoots for Vogue, uh, Harper's Bazaar, W, all the big name fashion mags. But what I like about his commentary is that he's always talking about I shoulda, woulda, coulda on every photograph. And he always dissects how, well, I should have changed this, I should have changed that. And what that is a realization to me is, is that how humble he is. And it's, it just shows how he's always setting his artistic roots on every shot. He's regrowing every shoot. And that's something that all of us really need to do is take every shoot and grow from that shoot. Shoot again and grow from that one. Sooner or later you'll, sooner or later you'll find what you want. Yes. Yes. I had no choice. It's a job. This is why I depend on artificial light. This is why Joey Quintero brings two 1200 watt second packs, DC powered. There, I cannot, like I said, I can shoot in the forest, on the street, on the moon. As long as I have my tools of my trade, I can do my light and focus. I can take care of the big threes. That's really it. I know. You, you, it's, that's the awful thing about shooting on assignment because people don't want to hear it. And they just want the shot. I, I still try to understand how you do this with the um, F311 um, relative to what? Because if you um, determine the, the shutter speed from going to the back, background or background here. The shutter speed at F11. OK, that's, okay so you have a different shutter speed for the object? Uh, no. OK, so for the ambient light. For the ambient light. Yeah, yeah. no, I understand that. So, no, the camera set it, okay, think of it this way. Let's back up. The camera set it F11 at 1 over 250, 100 ISO. Okay, that's how you get this shot. The pack is set up 
so I can get, when I, when I meter the subject, the pack is set so that when I pop the, sub, pop the subject, I'm getting an F11 on the subject matter, okay? Those two now match. My shutter speed, I mean my aperture on the pack, as well as my camera, as well as the meter, all say F11. The pack doesn't understand uh, uh, shutter speed. It doesn't. It understands. And shutter speed is irrelevant in strobe photography. Remember that. It's just, strobe, like, you, like you just cleverly said, strobe photography is going to, it fires anyway. Your shutter can keep up with that as long as your, ma your maximum shutter speed on your camera can. Okay, yeah. All it's going to control is your ambient. This is in the next class, and I'm giving you guys a little sneak in this. Because we're going to get it, we're, what we're going to do in the next class is we're going to drag everybody outside and we're going to do this shot. Yeah, no, no. You, you know? I, mean, I don't understand. Is, what, is the, what is the pack doing with the lens? I, you know, I see that as battery, and it doesn't really. It's very much like the same way your gas pedal says 60 miles an hour. There's no, no feel that you know on your gas pedal that says 60 miles an hour. You just, you just know that when you depress it so much that you're going to go so fast. He's confused with the uh, watt second. The watt seconds? Just yeah, it's just oh, dialing in. It's second. like a gas pedal. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know any. You, yeah, every pack has its own nomenclature, so you have to kind of again. There, every tool is different. Every tool, they have different ways of turning them on, turning them off, bringing them high, bringing them low. It's just, it's just, it really is just uh, the specifics of every power pack. You know, they deal in watt seconds, but that's a that's a different. It's a different way of looking at light. Couldn't create this kind of shadow and use that equation with continuous light. No, not outdoors. Or, or a speed light. Or a speed light. No. Uh, the question he was asking before about uh, how do you put F11 in the pack? So um, let's say you don't put F11 in the pack, you're just raising the power of the pack. Like a gas pedal. Yeah. Yeah, because every pack's different. Some have relative F stops, like the very fancy ones. Um, but it's never on the money. Just like, you know, you, you may drive two different Chevrolets and you press the, the, the gas pedal a certain time at a certain place on the same track under the same weather conditions. You're not going to, the gas pedal is never going to be exactly the same at 60 miles an hour. They both deviate just a, just a drop. Well, when you talk about the big screen, you always have to have two picks. And one is the moving. And if you, if you want to move it to 11, then the other two have to change. That's, that's just... Yeah, that's, is that the, that's one way of explaining it, yes. And depending on what you're doing. I have my method. What I usually do is Joey Quintero gets on a set. I find out what do we need sharp, how we want to shoot this. My first question, always what I'm shooting, is what F stuff am I dealing with? Basically, that tells me how much I want in focus. I always shoot at F11, F16, F22, because my guys want everything in focus because it's going to go to retouchers. Shoot at F11. I hit my stroke pack for F11. Okay. Let's say I have a nice forest background in back of me. I have to make sure that I measure my light in my background for an F11. In this case, it was 1 over 200. We shot it. We're done. OK? And again, classes that follow this one in the different series, we're going to get very advanced in that. We're going to get into gels, color rendition, tungsten, and flash ambient. OK? Hmm? Next year sometime. Next year sometime. <laughs> I, got, I think I have two more classes of this one, and I'm done. And then we're going to do uh, the, the advanced level. And then there's an intermediate, and then intermediate advanced. And then one class, we're going to go to my studio, and we're going to do a whole set. OK? Now, beauty dish. Very much like a silver umbrella. Has the same characteristics. Larger surface area. Has a very specular surface area. Tends to be more silver. Now, a lot of fashion guys use beauty dishes for two reasons. Because one, it's going to give them a lot of contrast. It's going to give them a lot of coverage because it's slightly inefficient. It's slightly a little more contrasty. And secondly, it's not like a setup like a softbox. Softboxes can be a bit yielding at times because you're dealing with poles and whatnot. This just goes on to the uh, light source, and you're done. Uh, why do they call them a beauty dish? That's a very good question. I don't know. I'm sure somebody out there used it on a beauty shot at some point. And if you find out, email me. I'd love to know. Uh, but beyond that, beauty dishes are extremely effective if you want a very nice, soft, slightly overblown, slightly contrasty, specular shot. And I'll show you one here in a sec. Um, again, 
I use the shower head theory a lot with soft boxes. Reason being is because it is a nozzle and it tends to throw the light everywhere. It's kind of hard to control, but it's, you'll get it there. And you always play with positioning on a, on a beauty dish. Everybody photographs differently on a beauty dish. I've seen guys use them straight up, 90 degrees above the head, and they get great stuff. I've seen guys use them straight up in front of the back of the camera. No right, no wrong. It's one of these uh, tools that keep it within your palette just so when you see it, play with it, get your shots done, and then move on. Um, this is kind of what we did here. You can see I have it well above the 20 degree mark. It's not at the 45 degree mark. It's almost, I want to say it's about right here, which is about 20 degrees from her nose. And again, probably 30, 40 degrees above the eye. And it tend to work on her. And believe me, I tried a couple different scenarios just so I could get it right, just so it was more pleasing. Um, this is a beauty shot that we did for a salon recently. I want to say that was the last job. Yeah, it was. Um, Kelly here, we shot her first with an umbrella and I realized that um, she shot better with a beauty dish. I think she did okay. Nice specularity in the eyes, it's flat. It tends to be a little more flat, but you know what was nice about this beauty dish? It allowed me to light my background with one light. So I got a two to one ratio with the one tool. It is almost head on, yeah. Almost. That was lit with the beauty dish as well. Basically what we did is we had our subject, she's sitting here, the beauty dish is just above, oh, I, want to say, I want to say it's just right above my, my head when I'm shooting. And that inefficiency of the beauty dish, the reflective properties of it is throwing light back onto the background. And because it's white background, it tends to be a little more reflective. That background not That's the real deal. Mm, that's like six feet. Six to eight feet easily. And again, we pumped it up. I'm shooting at F11, F16, because everything's got to be sharp. Questions? You guys are good. OK, second reflector we're giving away now, guys. OK? A 32 inch silver white reflector. I'm sorry about your Nolan Void from this one. <laughs> um, OK, if you need to stand up, describe the big three, and tell me what they do. Oh, no, we'll have you, because you shoot kids. Um, you got to stand up. That's fine. OK. You are done. You are extremely <laughs> thorough. Thank you. Well said. Thank, Thank you. you. Wow, guys, she's thorough. I'm almost intimidated. Whew. That's good. You're good. Very good. Um, she's absolutely right, guys. <laughs> um, practice the big three innately when you're walking around, when you're thinking about that composition that you want to put together, when you're thinking about your art, your photographs, your passion. And we've all sat there at some point. And we're all guilty of this, where you just look at something like, ah, I gotta do this shot, that's the shot, I know I'm gonna do this now. Start backing up, away from that creative drive a little bit, and start thinking about your tools, the big threes. How sharp do I want it? How much ambient do I need? Is this an action shot? What ISO do I need? Do I wanna add a little bit of creativity with a little bit of grain or not? Do I wanna go huge with this? You know, obviously, if you're dealing with ISO a little bit, you wanna go super huge with it, you wanna lower your ISO a little bit. Something obvious, but needs to be said. Um, some advice that was given to me throughout the years is master your ratios, guys. Very, 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 very important. Start thinking of F-stops, the big threes again. Know your equipment. 
Get to know that these are just tools that you need to grow on your own behalf. Beyond that, invest wisely. If you're not sure, rent, borrow, beg, don't steal, <laughs> but try to get equipment from your school or whatnot because the, you utilize your resources because once you buy this equipment, just like buying a new car off the lot, it's yours to keep. Okay, remember that. Invest wisely. Um, discover your process in making your art. Stick to your guns. One thing that I was told years ago when I was in Photo One, back at Pima College when I didn't know anybody and I already had graduated and I was the oldest student in the class and I already had a degree and I already taught high school and I already worked for a dermatologist and I felt like such a loser the, the one of the instructors told me that find your own art because somebody will find you yeah the class is really critiquing you really tough but somebody will find your fashion pleasing somebody will like your work if you like it there's a hundred more of you that will like it that's all it takes okay beyond that Lowell.com edu glossary is a good resource for all the definitions of lighting and whatnot. If you need to know what a what a uh, Quaker clamp is, or a gobo is, or even a C knuckle, or even if you don't know the difference between a quarter twenty and a three eighths pin, go there. They'll find it for you. If you're going to get into serious photography, you need to know your grip. Beyond that, if you're into fashion like moi, go to bwgrayscale.com. Every resource is there as far as old-fashioned magazines, editorials, different photographers. You want to see the next coach ad that was just put out in the city, whatever, it's there and you can kind of see who shot it, how they shot it or whatnot. Good resource. Um, just good to, uh, good to poke around and nose around it, that is. Uh, what else was I going to do here? Oh, if you have any questions, comments about this, I do have my business card here. Drop me an email. I will be more than happy to send you the PDF version of this lecture today. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I info at gratisgroup.com. And like I said, we are, we were, we are a manufacturing company. We design and produce photo, video, and audio accessories. And uh, I've been very, very fortunate in having my big hands and big mouth involved. Um, I do have one more reflector to give out. Let's go to a shot here. And let's give you guys a good quiz. Okay, one more reflector to give. This is Misha, a model that I shot well over a dozen times for a dozen jobs. Make a long story short, this was shot with 4x5 film. One of the last was slide film. Yeah. With Provia, yeah, it was, you know. Make a long story short is, okay. Sure, sure. Okay, now. Let's come up with a good question on this one. All right? Okay, first I'm going to tell you a couple things and then we'll give you the question. This was shot with strobe. Okay? You can see the light coming across her face. All right? This yellow rim light, that's also artificial. Okay? That's with a gel. Okay, this is where we're going to get into subtractive light. This is when the color wheel comes in. The gel okay, is actually orange. What did I do? Overexposed it or underexpose it? This is the next class. You have to get up. Now think of it. Now think of, now let's, let's, let's back up just a, two inches here before we, before we answer. The darker something is like black, okay, think about it. Black is the full absorption of color, okay? It's got a lot of color in it. As we shift here, we get less color. Okay, think of blue. Think of big, a big pool of water. We start diluting it with more water, it becomes more clear. Okay, so we're adding more light in this case. So to less saturate light, or less saturate color in this case, you add more light. Okay? Now who wants to get up here and tell me how I did this? 32 inch silver and white reflector, guys. I hate to throw it out. <laughs> Go ahead, come up here, buddy. Remember, it's an orange gel originally. Right. Yeah. Orange gel's on the darker side, so I think uh, you gave more exposure. And if Otherwise, I shot it, it be very orange. And if I shot her in F16, what it was my light at? Uh, 16, uh, uh, 22. You're the man. You got it. That's it. 
Simple as that. It's 22. Because basically what I did is I overexposed my orange. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Oh, please, please. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. So think about it. When you think about saturating your own color, saturating your background, saturating your subject matter, whatever, um, oh, what's his name? Bill Diodato. Bill Diodato is a very good, I call him a satura saturated artist, extremely efficient at that. Some guys do it better, some guys do it less, but Bill Diodato does it very well. Um, that's coming in the next class. But think about your backgrounds, think about your subject matter, think about what people are wearing as far as garments. Sometimes you have to purposely overexpose them to see detail in blacks, dark colors or whatnot. If you want to shift an orange to yellow, you know how to do that, just overexpose it. That's it. Again, I have my business cards here. Let me give you my business cards. Email me. It'll be my pleasure to give you this uh, PDF version. Okay, guys? And have a good day. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web 